Thank you very much. All right, guys. Um, so just to start, I just want to thank everyone for, for listening in. It's a real privilege to be invited to, um, to be speaking to you guys today on this webinar. Um, and just to add to that introduction, so my name's Matt. I've got a dual role. I'm Associate Professor at St Mary's in Strength and Conditioning Science, but then I'm lucky enough to have a consultancy role at Arsenal where I serve as Academy Research and Development Coordinator. But prior to that kind of academic background, I was a sports science strength and conditioning coach and practitioner for about 12 years full time at various clubs in England and also with England national teams. So I've got, a, I guess, a mixed background in practice and research, um, which hopefully flavours this, uh, this presentation a little bit. I want to start with some acknowledgements. Um, you know, as, as is the case with all of these presentations, only one person gets to present. But actually, you know, um, the, the lion's share of this content is the result of a lot of years of a lot of work from a lot of very talented practitioners and clinicians. And I want to point to them and their contribution to this. You know, I'm, I'm just a person delivering this presentation. So um, I guess where I'll add value to this is where I discuss how recent research processes and you know um, projects that we've run have informed and shaped the evolution of our testing process. But um, again, I, I, I don't want to take credit for what I'm about to present to you. Um, and I want to distribute it to those guys. Um, and in terms of conflicts, I, I declare none. I'm, unfortunately, I didn't invest in Vald and some of the other companies that I might cite today. Um, I wish I did, but I didn't. So I declare no conflicts. Um, in terms of introduction, um, again, like I'm, you know, I'm given 20 minutes to talk to you about something that I could probably speak to you for 20 years about. Um, but my aim is to provide you with a concise overview of what we do and why. Um, it's a way. I certainly don't consider it to be the way, and I, I, I don't really want any confusion with that. Um, again, like when you know when we get into the weeds of performance tests and what to test and what why and what not to test and why and those debates um, you know it's obvious that there's multiple candidate performance tests for all of these performance qualities and they're all limited by various constraints and the weight of those constraints will shape what's adopted and what's not adopted in in certain environments in my experience and indeed you know, your decision making in relation to what to test and why will vary based on the cohort that you're working with you know, firstly, whether it's academy or senior team or the, the performance level, but second, like the cultural backgrounds of those players as well on their prior experiences. Cultural factors, including, you know, uh, head coach and head coaching philosophy, philosophy across science and medical support departments as well will inform what you test and why, as will more obvious things like equipment, infrastructure, human resource, expertise, time, time probably being the most pertinent of these. And actually, what you find when you when you when you look at all of these factors is that um, actually it's a balancing act. You know, there's no perfect way of doing it, and you just need to find a way that a way of measuring the most important things as you consider them to be um, in the best way that suits the environment that you're in, and that will vary. And what I'm going to present to you is <clears throat> um, a way that serves our purpose where we are at the moment. So when it comes to selecting performance tests, um, I tend to, like when I teach students of all different levels, I, I tend to take this route of the, you know, uh, what Stephen Pliss dis discusses in the Moody and Jeffrey strength and conditioning text of this concept of a performance target. And in the, con in, I guess in the, you know, in the nature of football, the, the performance target represents the demands of the game or like the, the worst case uh, demands of the game. The end, the end goal for an academy setting would be like you know the worst case scenario match demands for Premier League or Champions League football, and we can you know we can quantify the performance target or or um, understand that better by breaking the demands down into three segments. So what are the movement skill demands of match play? What are the biomechanical demands of match play? And what are the bioenergetic demands of match play? And this begins us to I guess triangulate. Um, what we go after and why in terms of physical development. So movement skills, you know, like we know that things like acceleration, deceleration, change of direction, sprinting is super important uh, from a biomechanics perspective to support those high speed and high force activities, you know, like rate of force development as well as peak force is important and 
strength qualities are, are super important to support in those match demands. And from a bioenergetic perspective, we know that it's a high intensity, intermittent, long duration sport. So the capacity to repeatedly perform high intensity efforts for sustained periods of time is important. But to understand what players need, we've got to measure things and understand where they fit in relation to those match demands or the performance target. And only once we've measured where players are, can we begin to train those different subcomponents of performance and triangulate that on the performance target aligned with the match demands um, and build potentially more robust, but certainly more physically, better physically equipped players um, that are able to tolerate these match demands. So we tend to ask three main questions in that process, right? So what is the performance target? Where the, where the players need to be? And from an academy perspective, I think it's important to ask not only, you know, what are the current demands of academy match play and, and also first team match play, but also um, Champions League match play, for example, if there's a supplementary demand at those high levels of European competition, but also what are the future demands? What, what might those demands look like in five years, 10 years time? Because for some of the kids in academies, um, they're going to be playing at that level in, in those timeframes. So focusing on projecting forwards, I guess, is going to be important. And then asking the next question, once we know what that is, which we can get from literature and different modeling, but what is the current situation? So wh where is my player or team now? And what are their needs based on the gap between where they are now and where they need to be? And, you know, we'd encompass that as being like the player specific needs. And then finally, once we've once we've addressed those two things, we know where they need to be and we know where they are now. Can we get to this point of periodizing, periodizing training and, and you know, putting in place physical interventions to um, develop them, to prepare them for those demands? So how do I get my player there? What is the planned variation of means and methods? And we're getting into what Paul discussed in reconditioning in, in that section. So those questions should help refine our tests as well. But then on top of that, we've got this extra kind of scientific layer that we need to satisfy as well. So we know that physical performance tests should be valid. They should be reliable. They should certainly be relevant. I think for most environments, they should be time efficient because, um, you know, football players have lots of competing demands on their time, you know, from coaches and analysts and medical staff and so on and so forth. You know, it, it, it it needs to be a time efficient process but equally as important to, to all of those things it needs to be actionable it needs to give us a data point that um, enables us to put an intervention in place to to then um, serve an increase in physical performance potential or mitigate their injury risk otherwise what's the point you know like the the old the adage from british rowing was does it make the boat go faster you know that that kind of rhetoric that kind of notion is, is important here i think and i guess if you want to you know, um, read more about this basic construct, then, you know, look to that, you know, Moody and Jeffrey's text from, you know, uh, Stephen Plisk's section in that, but then also look at this um, review article by Paul Reed called Performance Modeling in uh, the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, uh, sorry, the Journal of Strength and Conditioning. It's uh, a useful read to um, add some context to this. Then also, I guess, fortunately, uh, where we are, uh, we have quite a large uh, research culture, research development and innovation culture, and the testing that we have in place at the moment has been flavoured by our, you know, previous and ongoing research in uh, sports science and strength and conditioning, principally. So, you know, thanks to, or partly thanks to a UEFA research grant that I was awarded a couple of years ago, we've run like a large array of studies, actually, looking at not only things like the test for retest reliability of um, neuromuscular performance tests like the count movement jump and different isometric strength measures. But we've also looked at how those measures respond acutely to match play. So we understand their reliability and their typical responsiveness. And we've also looked at how match load variables as well as physical capacity measures relate to acute changes in those, in those measures as well. So, you know, by doing that, we're giving ourselves you know, the best chance of understanding what's important and what's relevant and maybe what we need to keep a close eye on in our, you know, quarterly physical performance testing, but then also our more frequent daily monitoring as well or, or weekly monitoring. And we've looked at, you know, we're looking and have looked at cross-season responses to some of these measures as well. And, and only last week we've had this paper here accepted from our from our group where we looked at test retest reliability for 
some of the tests that I'm, I'm about to speak to you about. So it is grounded in research. So, um, you know, if we go back to our uh, performance target and, you know, biomechanics being a, a fundamental in, a fundamentally important paradigm of, of the performance target, we're going to get into testing for strength and power and uh, start with some of the rationale as to, you know, why we measure what I'm about to present to you. Well, you know, I guess we know that acute strength changes are commonly implicated in the etiology of injury risk in football players. You know, a recent epidemiological study showed that neuromuscular fatigue was a causal factor in about 65%, 50%, and 30% of hamstring, adductor, and quadricep injuries in Premier League under-18 academy football players. And we think, you know, by virtue of that data, that it's important to routinely measure the strength characteristics of those at-risk muscle groups. And that kind of justifies some of our unilateral muscle-specific, if you like, testing alongside our more global performance measures of maximum strength. So this is our approach to strength and power testing. Um, again, like from a maximum strength perspective, we have one primary test, which is the isometric mid thigh pull. And we adopt the protocol proposed by Paul Comfort and colleagues back in 2019. And our key performance measure there is relative peak force, which enables us to compare you know, within and between players and cohorts. From a, a, a single limb, like a unilateral perspective, our primary measures that we're interested in are isometric posterior chain peak force using the Alan McCall method that um, they published a paper on back in 2015. Um, eccentric posterior chain peak force, which is derived from the valve Nord board. And then um, isometric adduction and abduction peak force and hip flexion and seated plantar flexion peak force that are all uh, tests derived from the valve force frame as well. Um, and again, like for some of those tests, we've uh, we've reported the test retest reliability for our, our KPIs in, in that most recent publication. And then from a power or reactivity perspective, uh, we've got several bilateral and unilateral tests. So we use the counter movement jump um, um, as a measure of uh, bilateral power. We use the flight time equation as opposed to the impulse momentum equation which I, I know is going to spark some debate amongst the biomechanists in the audience. But, you know, we've done that because we found um, far better test retest reliability statistics for that method than the impulse momentum method. And even anecdotally, seen some very spurious results using that equation. Um, we do the single leg derivative of the counter movement jump for uh, single leg power. And then we have a, an in-house 10-1 as opposed to a 10-5 protocol where we look at the best um, jump in that series of reactive jumps to measure player reactivity. And again, that, those tests are done on force plates. Um, so our method for um, testing for speed and change of direction, again, we can link this to the movement skills component of our um, performance target model, but it of course also connects to the biomechanics um, aspect as well. So um, there is, you know, kin kinetic and kinematic aspects to this. So um, for speed, we test speed across two primary distances. So 10 meters and 30 meters, obviously 10 meters being synonymous to player acceleration and 30 meters being synonymous to player maximal running speed. Um, multiple GPS measures are controlled by our maximal um, running speed measure. Um, and also, you know, obviously football being a repeat acceleration sport, deceleration sport, it's important to quantify acceleration capacity, right, uh, or ability. So not only do we measure these times, but we also film this testing in the sagittal plane, as you can see there, to pick up on any important, you know, um, errors according to our technical models for uh, maximal running uh, speed or acceleration and that gives I guess a coachable point for our physical development coaches to um, put an intervention in place to improve movement mechanics and in return mitigate injury risk and improve on-field application. Um, change of direction um, again like this is you know hotly debated how how and if you do this um, we, we think it's important to measure change of direction competency and so um, we measure um, isolated, um, isolated single turn um, competency by way of looking at change of direction deficit. 
So um, we use the modified 505 change of direction deficit test, where we subtract the best 505 um, test completion time for the left limb and the right limb from the linear 10 meter sprint speed to show the time cost of changing direction on the left limb and the right limb. And we also film that as well to give us again, like a, uh, an extra um, tool in our armory, if you like, for, for coaching interventions. And then finally, like the, the final, the final um, um, piece of that performance target model was bioenergetics. And so our testing for endurance um, or four hour test or our test for endurance is the 3015 test. We look at the, the VIFT measure from that test. Um, we moved away recently from using the 1K time trial. And, you know, the, the um, most commonly used 1K time trial is a series of 100 meter shuttles and just looking at time to completion and then, you know, dividing that by the distance to get maximum aerobic speed. We found that problematic in terms of pacing strategies, but also in terms of player groupings. And we find that there's less of an influence from those um, or from motivation, but also from peer pressure, if you like, when completing the 3015 test compared to that. But we also, of course, you know, bow down to the weight of research showing that it's, um, you know, um, a very useful tool in terms of prescribing metabolic conditioning. And, you know, of course, it's shown greater efficacy for, um, for its capacity to control exercise intensities for, you know, 30 second and 15 second intervals that you might be doing in like the middle and latter stages of, of, of pre-season, for example. So um, it serves as a, as a, you know, valid and reliable and relevant performance test because we're actually measuring high intensity intermittent running performance as opposed to um, steady state running. Um, which we get in the um, 1K time trial, but also it's it's used to inform our training prescription across pre-season and reconditioning in scenarios like injury, et cetera. So um, that that in a nutshell is our our um, you know um, battery of tests that we roll out across the um, academy at Arsenal, and a little bit of understanding as to why and how you know research has informed that. Um, but equally important, or it, we, as you know, it's, it's equally important as well as collecting good data to report it back in the correct manner as well, in my experience, you know, and I think we need to present data back in a way that visually connects with players and coaches that makes it readily interpretable and actionable, um, you know, and so this is our brief approach to this. So I presented you with two player profiles, one on the left and, and one on the right. Um, the player on the left is a forward. Um, it's all it's all anonymized data. The player on the right is a midfield player. Um, and I'll, I'll just talk you through the the brief structure of this. So um, there's some basic information like age, height, mass, lean mass, fat mass, and fat free mass that comes from you know DEXA scans that we complete at the training ground. There's some basic injury statistics presented there as well, and then you know some bullet point areas to um, improve on from a from a medical injury history and, and performance profiling perspective, but then there's also their data presented in um, absolute terms for each of their key physical performance tests, their unilateral tests, their bilateral tests, as well as like metabolic tests and change of direction speed, etc. And then what we've also done there, this this is nothing new really, but it's a powerful way of conveying strengths and weaknesses, is plotted their profile for each of those tests relative to their peers. So there's an instant rationale available for a coach when um, they ask a player to complete a specific intervention, whether that's to, you know, to improve maximum strength or maximum speed, power, reactivity, endurance. Um, it's because it's there in black and white and they can see how they fare next to their peers. And we can further break that down to positional analyses and historic data or first team comparative data if we want to um, or if we need to. But in this case, you can see, for example, that the player on the left who's a forward predictably is competent in aspects like power, reactivity and acceleration and speed. Whereas the player on the, on the right who's um, a central midfield player is more competent for endurance, for example. Um, and, you know, we can then point to 
specific areas to develop these guys over the long term. And that's how we apply our testing as well as a rationale as to what we test. Um, we then convert those summated Z scores into a total score of athleticism using, you know, um, the, the method proposed by Anthony Turner and colleagues back in 2019, which um, gives a useful overall um, understanding of physical competency for, for individual players. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily do much for prescribing practitioners, um, but it gives a good holistic overview of physicality um, to, to use to justify uh, subsequent interventions. And on that note, that is the end of my presentation. And I'd, I'd like to thank you all for listening.